it's complicated by the fact that pe some people are qualified, some people are about to qualify, and some people are nowhere near qualifying. But what is important for all three of those groups is that you cannot train flat out for six months. Super excited to be with you today. This is the first edition of UP. It's uh, a journey to get you to the Comrades Marathon. My name is Brad Nadolf. It is so great to have you with us. Uh, Lindsay Perry, the official Comrades coach, is with us today as well. Uh, Lindsay, it's awesome to be back on, on these weekly podcasts. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Um, and we are doing an UP run again for the first time in many years. So it was fitting for us to go right back to the beginning where we started, and that is talking about comrades. Um, and yes, it's an uprun. People are excited and nervous. Um, and so it's just a great way to interact with our comrades database and make sure that everybody gets to the start line and make sure that everybody finishes. Yeah, Lindsay, I, I let the cat out of the bag saying it's great to be back doing these weekly. And that's exactly what we are going to be doing every single week from now until race day, Comrades 2024. We'll be publishing one of these uh, and then hopefully continuing through uh, after that as well. Uh, and you, you said this is how we, we sort of started. And I was doing the maths before we hopped on this call. You're going to laugh. It was 2011 that we actually started doing the first one. So we've been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, obviously, technology's changed a little bit, but uh, you can pick this up on YouTube. You can watch us on YouTube, or you can listen on whatever podcast player you listen to as well. Lindsay, essentially, uh, it, yesterday, uh, as we record this, was 18 weeks to, to race day. So whenever you're listening to this, this coming weekend will be 17 weeks, and it is the start of February. So we are pure like like really into comrade season right now obviously we're not in peak training just yet but uh let's chat about sort of more or less where folks should be right now and there's a couple of different streams of of runners we're going to be talking about today i also want to let you know that i have a bit of a gripe which i'm going to bring up a little bit later on in the podcast and i think it might get people talking but uh, i i'm a bit irritated after this weekend to be honest and i'll let you know a little bit more about that but let's talk about sort of where we should be right about now in our comrades training yeah, we should really be holding back. I mean, I think that's a, that's a key word for the next four weeks, essentially, but certainly now for, for at 17 weeks out. Look, in South Africa, Comrades is the running event on the calendar. There are 20,000 plus athletes that line up to run 87 kilometers. As I said, it's, it's an up run again, so a lot of excitement, a lot of nerves. But really what happens on the 1st of January is everyone wakes up and goes, oh boy, it's only six months to comrades. Um, and so people come out of the blocks and come out of the blocks hard. Now, it's complicated by the fact that pe some people are qualified, some people are about to qualify, and some people are nowhere near qualifying. But what is important for all three of those groups is that you cannot train flat out for six months. And so really 17 weeks out, it's really about habit, consistency, getting in the groove, getting into the habit of alarm goes off, I get up, I get my morning started, I go out, I do what I need to do, I'm doing my strength training, I'm doing my runs, but there shouldn't be a focus on very high volumes. We really are building up and we want to build up slowly. If you are leading into a qualifier, yes, you are going to be doing a little bit more training. But then it's so important, and, and, and I think we'll, we'll discuss that perhaps in more detail on another podcast, but what I just want to emphasize is that if you are about to qualify, if you've built up to a marathon, so you are training quite hard now, then it's key that you make sure you recover properly. And there is time. 17 weeks to go, there is time. Now, when we get to 12 weeks out, I will tell you the time to panic is now okay so that is when we really want to be in peak training but until then we are building ourselves up to that peak training so if you've qualified you're in the pound seats and that invariably is always the biggest issue for people who start training for comrades late and i'm using that term quite loosely there brad because there is loads of time um but because of qualifying cutoff dates because if you do want to while you are you know, getting fit and training for comrades, you might want to do a race like Two Oceans um, in South Africa. Those are two biggest races, Two Oceans and 
comrades and and let's not forget that uh cape town is is trying to climb up the rankings but that's becoming a really great race a big south african race in the second half of the year but the reality is there are other ultras and races that people want to do and often you have to qualify for those and that puts you under pressure oceans you've got to qualify by the third of march comrades you've got to qualify by may so remember these timelines you do have time and the most important aspect of qualifying is qualifying when you're ready okay so if you have qualified you're in the driving seat you can build up slowly really plan your year ahead plan the races you're going to do as part of your preparation for comrades and work your way towards that peak training so now we just want to be consistent yeah, Lindsay, we're going to talk a little bit about planning later on in this podcast as well. But you, you talk about not panicking just yet. And I, I, I've i had the experience where if you are training super hard in January, by the time April comes and then May, you so over this race already that you just want it to come. And that's not how you want to be going into the, the last little bit of, of comrades training where you actually are in peak training, uh, being, as, as we say here in South Africa, gutful. Uh, just really tired and and not loving your life. So it's it's important to be training. Don't don't get us wrong, but it's you don't have to be doing massive amounts of mileage now. Now it's just about building that foundation, right? Absolutely. Now is just as I said, habit and consistency. If there was a specific area of your training that I would really like to emphasize, seventeen weeks out of strength training. I mean, you you just you can't go wrong by adding strength training to your routine and now while we are slowly building up that consistency and volume of your training is a great time to be really piling into that strength training so that when you get into the peak running training you are strong you can handle the training you're a better athlete your risk of injury is lower so those are really all the, the 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 good reasons why you should be doing strength training now, or if you aren't doing it, why you should be starting it now while your volume is a bit lower, so you can get it part of your routine. Your body can get used to doing it, and you can benefit from the gains that you're going to get from it. We're going to talk lots more about strength training uh, on next week's podcast, but. Lindsay, uh, or, or let me just also just say, we, we do have a free strength band. If you would like to download it and get started right now, uh, just check out the description of this podcast, either on YouTube or the podcast player you're listening to. You can click through and download that strength plan now. Uh, Lindsay, we often, or I say we, you, you often talk about sort of racing your qualifier uh, and trying to get a better seeding. For for the guys who, who possibly qualified in October last year, let's say at Cape Town Marathon and are running another marathon now, is it still okay? Is it still early enough to be pushing slightly harder to try and improve that seating? Or is it a case of make sure you're running everything comfortably right now, even, even your qualifiers? Yeah, you, you could you could um, improve your seating now. Uh, I think what's much more important is just understanding what the role of seating is and then making smart decisions about that, particularly once we get into March. Once you're in March and you really want to be training hard, not recovering from races, not risking injury by doing races, and then um, you know you've gone too hard. So, but now you have to train. You don't want to give yourself the time to recover, so you start training too soon and you get injured. So, I think let's let's just take a step back and look at what is the role of seeding. Okay, essentially, seeding by its very definition is there to ensure the safety of the runners. Okay, so. If we have the faster runners at the front and they clear off and they're gone, then people can't get trampled underfoot. We aren't running into the back of people, tripping and falling and having a, a mass of humanity coming over. So I think let's first understand that that it's about safety. So when we get runners like we did in the previous comrades that are tearing down the, the um, barriers and You've got run much slower runners forcing their way into seating pens that are, are much higher up. That really does constitute a risk to everybody. Okay. And so if people can firstly understand, I know that it's stressful, I know that it feels like the people who can least afford to lose time are losing time. Just understand that the seating is by and large 
a safety issue and making sure that we get people across the start line safety safely without incident okay so once you understand a that's what seating's for and two if we break it down and remove the we'll try to remove the emotion and the fear around the fact that you're going to be losing so much time it's really only g and h that lose a lot of time and i'm not trying to play it down i know that it's difficult um and if you are in g and h you really are looking at losing between eight and 12 minutes but that's the thing it really continues so the guys in in b c and d lose almost nothing like it's less than two minutes and the guys in e and f then take it from two to around four minutes and then it, it starts to balloon six eight ten ten minutes behind that so you are going to lose time so that is why people are so hell-bent on on improving their seating and worried about it and talk about it all the time and try and get forward at inappropriate moments so let's break it down like this if you are in the right frame of mind if you are fit enough if you have been training well then yes you can improve your seating now okay after that the best you can hope to do is to improve by one seating there are so few people that have the ability to move up two seating pens or improve a marathon time by 40 minutes i mean that is just an enormous improvement so very few people are going to move two seating pens and and then save themselves between three and five minutes depending on on if you're going from from h and you are jumping all the way to f then yes perhaps you are going to to save yourself five minutes but for everyone else the best you can hope to do is to move forward one seating pen and that means that the best you are going to do is to win yourself two minutes on race day but you have to consider the cost of those two minutes. If you were to miss a month of training because you get injured during a marathon or because you get injured because you start training too soon after your marathon, you are going to lose more than two minutes on race day, much more than two minutes on race day. If you were to go, right, my qualifying time is 4.45, perhaps I could go a little bit faster, but if I do, the cost is going to be too high. But if I were to train now and train properly for comrades, I can make myself so that I'm 10, 15, 20 minutes better as an athlete over 87 Ks rather than worrying about those two minutes. And then there is the other factor that we will talk about way closer to the race. If I go into details now, you know, people are just going to it. but if you plan your race day if you execute your race day if you don't waste time on race day those 12 minutes that you lose are going to be the only 12 minutes that you lose and most people waste way more than those 8 to 12 minutes by the way they conduct themselves in the race than they do at the start and that's why it starts to add up uh, and you don't finish so i think planning your actual race and sticking to it is going to save you way more time than racing a marathon in march or april to try and get two minutes ahead in the starting pens now lindsay talking about those the the seeding and the seeding batches particularly at the start i think it's also important to remember that the the up run is very different to the down run so you you start on a, a, a probably a much wider road in durban it is two lanes but it is slightly wider but it actually, you, you spill out onto the highway almost immediately as you head out of Durban. Whereas Maritzburg, it does get very narrow. It's very congested. So you, you probably end up losing time, more time in Maritzburg on the down run crossing the start line than you do in Durban to start with. But you also then have a bit of congestion as you head up towards Polly Shorts on the, the down run. Whereas in Durban, you don't have that issue. You spill out on the highway and it opens up and that's it like you you lose very little time and i don't think people realize that in gnh i've been lucky enough when you're my size and you're not built like a kenyan marathon runner they make you watch everyone else start first so uh it does the down run you you get out of there much quicker than the up run. uh other way around other, you get out of the, yeah. the, the down run up run much quicker than the up run. it's it's an ex excellent point and it's not 
Yes, you spill onto the highway quickly, but it's more than that. The road that we start on in Durban for the uprun is just much wider, full stop, than starting outside City Hall. So, no, you're absolutely right. So, you probably on the uprun are looking between six to eight minutes rather than on the down run where you're looking eight to 12 minutes in um, H batch. Yes, good point. Cool. And then, Lindsay, obviously, people are following training plans. We've got a whole bunch of training plans on the, the Coach Perry app. Uh, there, there's some training plans on, on the Comrades Marathon website. Lots of people write Comrades training plans. And one of the mistakes that we see people making is, is going, you know what, I'm a 11 hour 30 Comrades runner or 11.45 Comrades runner, so I'm going to train for a sub 10 just to make 100% sure that if the wheels come off, at least then I'm, I'm in for a, a, a 11 and a half or a 11.45 or a bronze. They go, you know what, I'm a 12 hour runner, I'm going to train for a sub 11. Uh, how should we, let's talk about what training plan you should be on for your ability and let's go across the board. I think it's not just the back of the packers that, that struggle with this, it's everyone. Yeah, I, I'd say... It's probably one spot in front. So, so probably the, the most important decision that you need to make is what training plan, plan am I going to follow? And by um, inference then, like what, what am I capable of running at Comrades? What am I going to train for? And then the second biggest decision you can make is to add the strength training. But really being on the right training plan and the right training plan for you that is such an important decision for comrades. Now, I've had this conversation many, many times, and Brad has heard me having the conversation, hence why he framed the question like he did. And that is that people often think that if they do a little bit more, they will make sure. And again, I think just like with the seating issue, understanding why the plans are written the way they are written is the key to making the right decision for you as an athlete. So as we move from the guys that are winning the race, that way, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to believe this sometimes when I say it out loud, but like 40, between 46 and 52 kilograms, that, that's what the people who are winning the race weigh. So now you can understand that, that person can tolerate a lot more steps of hitting the ground because they hit the ground with far less force than i do far less for, force than brad does and so they can afford to run more and do more training coupled with the fact that their genetics i'll finish this point brad and then you can jump in and say what you want to what you want to add but coupled with that that their genetics just mean that even when they do the damage they recover so much faster than than we do and that trend kind of flows back in the field. Like you've got the winners are there, your silver medal guys are, and 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 um, Isabel Rosh Kelly females tend to be um, lighter. And as we move backwards, and I know there are a few exceptions to the rules, guys. I, I accept that. But as a general principle, as we move back, biomechanics degrade, ability to to recover degrades the actual force with which we hit the ground increases. And so the plans are written, not just with the finishing time in mind, but also with the type of runner and the ability of the runner that's following that plan in mind. I'm going to propose something, Lindsay. This is if I was the race director, because this brings me back to a conversation that I had with Stephen Muzingi uh, after I finished my first comrades many years ago. And I asked him, somebody took a photo of the two of us next to each other. It's like Laurel and Hardy. It's ridiculous. Like I'm six foot forever. This guy's tiny. Uh, and I said to him, how much do you weigh? And he said to me, he weighed 40, I think he weighed 46 kgs, that, that comrade that he won. And I was three times his weight, like literally more than three times the guy's weight. And I think they need to bring up a handicap system for comrades runners. So if he finishes it in five and a half hours and I weigh three times more than him, I should get three times the amount of time that he took to finish. And then they should work out the prizes from that. So if I go faster than my handicap, I should beat him and they should give me the money. So uh, I think I think we should we should bring that in. Uh, I think a lot of people would be game for that. What do you reckon? Look, in the States, it's literally why they have these these categories. Um, so that that they they're not competing against each other, but 
it just reflects that it's that much harder. You expend that much more energy. It takes that much more of a toll on you than it does Stephen Zingi. And, and just, and this is where appearances are also deceiving. I mean, Stephen Zingi always struck me as one of the stronger slash more muscular comrades winners. Um, but there you have it. I mean, he, he still weighs in the forties. So yeah. And, and I think that's really to emphasize that is that we are all different. And that a 12 hour comrades finisher is not the same as an 11 hour comrades finisher and the plans reflect that. So to give you just some sense of how to pick your plan, if you've done a marathon, it makes it much easier because the further we run, the more accurate these predictive models become. And so if you're running under three hours for a marathon, then you can look at running under seven and a half hours for comrades. If you are running between like 3.30 and just under 3.40, you are a Bill Rowan candidate. Under four hours for a marathon, you're a Robert Macholi candidate. And then um, under four, 4.24, but we, we'll, we'll be generous and say that 4.30, you probably have the ability to run under 11 hours. So anything up to four and a half hours, you are training for a, a bronze and then everyone's slower than 430 and i've already been a little bit generous there 430 and slower you must be on the finishers plan and that will take you to the finish line running the comrades marathon doesn't have to be scary and intimidating just thinking about running 90 kilometers or 56 miles should give you butterflies in your stomach Add to that the hills you have to run up and down and having to do it in under 12 hours. The thought of it is enough to freak the most seasoned runner out. Never mind a newbie to ultra running or a Comrades Marathon novice. As much as Comrades is a physical challenge, it's just as much a mental challenge. The constant mental gymnastics of second guessing yourself takes its toll. Am I training enough? How long should my long runs be? How many marathons should I run? What does this pain in my knee mean? My ankle is sore. Should I rest or run? And then the two big ones. Am I fast enough? And will I finish? The questions never stop. The constant worrying is exhausting. And that's exactly why we've created the Comrades Marathon Training Roadmap. It's a proven step-by-step -step training plan to get you from where you are today to having a Comrades medal around your neck without the stress and worry. Knowing that you've done what it takes to finish the ultimate human race, feeling strong and in control. Ensuring that you arrive at the start line fit and most importantly, injury-free, because more than 64% of those who didn't finish the race last year started with an injury. The Comrades Marathon Training Roadmap guides you through every step of your Comrades journey. Training, qualifying, tapering, and race day. We've got you covered every step of the way. Simply head over to coachparry.com forward slash up to get access to it now, or simply click on the link in the description. That's coachparry.com forward slash up. Now back to the podcast. So we now know what plan we should be we training on. And, and Lindsay, the, the paces in the, in those training plans are quite important too. It's, it's not a case of that that's the bar. And if you're running way faster than the training plans, then you are A for away. You want to, you want to stick to those plans. I don't know if you want to get into the reason behind that uh and yeah just to especially with a race like comrades where a lot of people think wow like do i really need to have to or do i need really need to run that slowly yeah and that's a, a fantastic question brad it, and it makes me realize i actually didn't explain the previous point well enough because that is the point is that those plans are built with specific mileages and intensities in mind okay the intensities that you train at are so critical, both from injury prevention, but also from your optimal development as a runner point of view. And so that is the crux of these plans, is that they are written with that ability so that you do in particular, but it's not limited to, but particularly that you do run your easy runs easy enough and that you then do your other harder runs at the right intensity for you but rather the, the, i think in a nutshell the reason why or let me explain the reason why you want to be running slower and it's because when we do the easy runs we are really trying to stimulate specifically aerobic adaptation we are trying to improve your body's ability to use the oxygen that's in the air 
get it into the lungs, through the alveoli, into the blood, transport that to the working muscles so that the majority of the energy that you are using, particularly come comrades race day, is from aerobic pathways in the presence of oxygen. And so those are the processes that we are looking to improve when we are running easy. Um, and we want to do that with doing the least amount of damage physically. Now, that aerobic adaptation that I'm talking about, that happens on a broad range, okay? Probably up to 90 seconds per kilometer slash mile. That's how broad this range is. So just because I've got the maths in my head, I'm going to use a silver runner. So for a silver runner, someone who's borderline seven and a half hours, that aerobic range ranges from somewhere around 445, 450 per kilometer to about 520 per K. So that's a really nice broad range. But anything from about 5 to 510 is safely inside that range, but much lower impact forces than on the 440 to 450. So 440 to 450, getting great aerobic adaptation, but high degree of damage because you're hitting the ground way harder. We go to the 5, 5, 5, 10, 5, 15, we're still getting the same aerobic adaptation, but now we're hitting the ground far, far softer. So that eccentric load, the muscles contracting while they lengthen and your and your quads, for, the, for example, are acting as a shock absorbent absorber, dampening that impact and stopping you from collapsing. That is much lower at at um, 5.20 or 5.15 than it is at 4.50. And so that's why you want to run easy and that's how the plans are written and that's why the pace recommendations are as they are. All right, cool stuff. Uh, Lindsay, let's talk a little bit about, before I get into my gripe, uh, I, I think I mustn't forget that, but let's talk a little bit about planning your year. So we, we as, as we're recording this, beginning of Feb, and you mentioned qualifiers, and then planning out your year. The long run is a massive point of debate amongst runners in, in the build-up to comrades. And the timing, that, first of all, the distance and the timing. But let's let's talk about the, the, the timing more than, than anything. When, when should we be, because logistically, we're talking about it now in February. You're not going to be doing your long run now, but you need to plan this ahead of time. So let's talk about the timing of your, your long runs in the build-up to comrades. Yeah, so uh, again, these are such key key questions to the process. And the reason why we want to set the long run now is because all of our other longer runs are going to be keyed off of when that is. Okay, So if you're a novice, and in particular, if you're a novice to running, and running comrades is what got you into running, and you have very low mileage on, on your body, you you. You need to be quite careful about how you do this. Now, the reality is that the long run, from a pure physical point of view, do we need to run 50 plus kilometers for comrades? Absolutely not. In fact, if we're going to really burrow down into it, you, you probably shouldn't. Never mind, do you have to? You, you, you shouldn't run that far. But we are going to run that far because it does provide some pretty useful information on a few key fronts um, which we will really dive into in detail uh, much later in the series but really around preparation mental toughness um, nutrition clothing etc so those are all good reasons why we do do it but the fact that it's really not the ideal thing to do and especially for newbies it's, it's probably slightly counterproductive physically that's why we do it further back. We do it six weeks from race day. So you can get all, all of the positive benefits from it, but then we also give you time to recover from it. So six weeks out is when you're going to do it if you're an absolute novice and newbie to runner. Uh, comrades, runners with more experience um, will go at about five five weeks out, and it's only the, the like real top achievers, your five percenters, your your guys that have are and 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 ladies that are running under um three hours for the marathon 
that will look at doing that long run four weeks out. So we've got six weeks for novices and newbies. We've got five weeks out for more experienced athletes. And we've got four weeks out for the, the, the very fast. And then we'll work all our long runs backwards from there. Okay? And what we want is a minimum of three weeks between 40 plus kilometer workouts. So any runs that are 40 k's or more, we want three to four weeks. So once you know what, what your date is for your long run, you can go back three, four weeks and plug in your next long one. And then three, four weeks, and plug in your next long one. And we want a maximum of three, including qualifiers, etc. Maximum of three. And I'm talking to everyone except the guys that are running faster than three hours. Yeah, I always make this joke, Brad. And it's it's if you don't have friends and you don't like your family and you've got loads of spare time, then you you train for a for a silver. And of course, because you are built differently and you do have a little bit more time to recover, etc., um, they will do more of those. But for the vast majority of comrades the other 95 percent of us normal runners we will have three to four weeks between i'm going to ask you this question because i know we often get a lot of pushback and particularly the the comrades runners who have been around the block a few times uh when you talk about not having to go longer than 50 k's what what response do you have to somebody that goes well how do i go from 50 to almost 90 on race day surely surely just from a mental perspective that's such a big jump I, I always take the, these things to the end uh, of the the story. And that's what happens if you're training for 100 miles? What happens if you're training for 200 miles? Somewhere along the line, your training run becomes too damaging for it to really bring you any material benefits. And in fact, it'll it'll just do you way more harm than good so and comrade is comrades is on that tightrope brad it's like the, whether you 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 know 50 to 60 k's that's that's far and if we break it down into time and that's often when the penny can drop for people if we break it down into time if you are training to run a silver comrade and you go out and do a 50k training run that's going to take you about four hours actually less than four hours so you're going to be out there training four hours now you're training for a sub 11 and you go and run 50 k. You're going to be there almost double. You'll be out there almost double that time. You're going to be out in the sun on your feet, pounding the road for seven, seven and a half hours. So even if you do that at the right intensity so that you're doing the same level of damage as I am, your exposure to that intensity over such a long period of time means that you just get to the point of diminishing returns okay so you definitely don't want to be doing much more than 50. of course i have to asterisk it because we do have two oceans um, it is a great run i do encourage people to do it because it is one of south Africa's great runs but then you have to understand that it's going to do damage and it is going to impact your performance come comrades and the more important comrades is to you the easier you need to do two oceans the harder you do two oceans the more it's going to compromise your performance at comrades that is the reality but since less than two percent of the field are actually lining up to try and win the rest of us must enjoy ourselves and that includes com uh, oceans but then you know why you're doing it don't fool yourself into thinking at 56 k's is great or the right training for comrades it's not it's far and it does damage but it is a great race do it for the right reasons and then adapt your training around that so that you so that you recover the best you can but accept that it is going to have a compromise on your comrades performance absolutely all right let us know in the comments when are you planning on doing a long run what are you doing for your long run just for interest sake, we'd love to love to know. Pop those into the comments. Uh, before we wrap things up, Lindsay, my gripe. Uh, I I live in Cape Town, right? As you as you know, I, I used to live in Joburg for for many years, and I've been running a fair whack in Cape Town, and I didn't pick it up until I was in Joburg last week. And Cape Town runners are going to hate me for this, but I want to know why they are so unfriendly. 
Like, literally nobody in this town greets each other when they're running. Like, Joburg last week, every single person I ran past, how's it? Hand up. Nice to see you. Cape Town, like, nobody greets anyone. And I want to know why that is. You, you've had similar experiences. You must have. You've lived in Cape Town as well. But my experience was worse than people not greeting us. I, 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 I was uh, in town for a wedding, and I ran from um, Steenburg into Noordhoek. On the one day and the other day i ran into what used to be um a forest but you know it had, i don't know if it was had been burnt down or cut down but i was i was fairly disappointed to get there used to ride my, my mountain bike there once upon a time um, but anyway but on both of those those uh runs um and they were both way in excess of two hours yeah people it's not that they don't greet you bad they don't greet you back so I would greet, and they wouldn't greet me back. And then coming back from Nerdhook over Cops of Whip, I was just not feeling great. And I decided I'm, I'm going to stop. And so I turned my watch off. Because I was like, if I turn my watch off and I zero it, then that's it. The run is over, and I'm going to get a lift back. Well, nobody stopped to check if I was OK. I mean, I understand you're running and you're sweaty, so people might not want you in their nice fancy car, but nobody stopped to check if I was okay. Eventually, after walking for three kilometers, I was like, well, I'm going to get home much faster if I just suck it up and run the rest of the way home. So, um, no, those are my two stories. And when I got back, I asked, would you like to move back to Cape Town? I said, you know what? I love Cape Town. I love coming to visit. But no, I like it that when I run, People will greet me, and and sometimes in Joburg I'll run, and someone will just start running with me, and we will just run along and have a cool chat for for three, four, five, six, seven, eight k's, and then that'll be that. Yeah. So I, I Cape Town runners are probably going to hate me for saying this, but you need to lift your game. Like that is, uh, I live here, and I'm sick of as Lindsay said, greeting people and just being ignored. Uh, so uh, come on, Cape Town, you can do better. It's the most beautiful city in the world, but you really do need to lift your game. Linz, as always, awesome to catch up. Looking forward to the next one. We'll chat a week from now. Uh, everyone else, happy training. Uh, stay consistent. No big mileage. Comrades, it's a long way away. Uh, make sure you recover properly. Watch your nutrition. And we'll chat again in a week. From myself, Brad Adult, and Lindsay Perry. Cheers.